In the first section of this chapter, we looked at motion in a straight line. So we lay out a coordinate axis along a line. We have a positive direction, we have a negative direction. Um, and we talked about displacement, which is your net change in position, versus total distance traveled, where we integrated the speed. We want to do the same thing with, with motion in the plane, so in the xy plane, in R2, two-dimensional two real Euclidean space, or in three dimensions, x, y, and z space. Um, so that's why last time, in the last video, we went over the um, Appendix A, a quick introduction to uh, vectors. Um, so what would we like to do? We'd like to look at displacement and distance traveled in space or in the plane. We'll treat mainly the space case because it looks more complicated and typically you expect something to be moving in space. And if you can do that case, you can do the case of a plane just by leaving off the z-coordinate. So what, what do we have? You have, we'll have some object. I frequently refer to it as a particle. So think of some particle moving in space along some curve. Then as we look that, we talk about the position vector of the particle at each point in time. So that's supposed to be an arrow. Um, you have a position vector, P of t, that tells you where the particle is at each time in space. P of t, this position vector, well, it's specified by its three component functions. You tell someone the x-coordinate of the particle at each time and the y-coordinate at each time. And if we're in space, the, the z-coordinate at each time. If you're not in space, you just wouldn't have this where you can think, oh, the xy-plane is where z is zero. Either one of those is fine. So you have this position. It's a vector, but it's just the position. You should think of the position as a vector function. And then what's the velocity? The velocity is just the derivative of the position. That's just like it is when you're moving in a straight line. So the velocity vector is the derivative of the position vector. And you take that derivative component-wise. So it just means you differentiate each component function. If you got to define how you, what differentiation of a vector function meant, I'm sure this is what you'd say. So this is the velocity of the object. It's a vector. Um, we can also differentiate the velocity and get the acceleration, but we actually won't use that in this section. Um, <coughs> you can integrate. You can take indefinite integrals, and you do that component-wise. So the indefinite integral of the velocity, so an antiderivative, anti or the most general antiderivative of the velocity, well, you do it component-wise. You anti-differentiate each component function. But that means you would get an antiderivative of x prime when we get x of t but maybe plus a constant. So you get x of t plus some constant. And an antiderivative of y prime of t. Oh, y of t, but maybe plus some constant. And then you get, oh, a z of t. And there might be, there could be an arbitrary constant here. If you split this up, we know how you add vectors. This is x of t, y of t, z of t plus the vector of constants, c1, c2, c3. So what you get is completely analogous to what you get for motion in the plane. You get the position vector back plus a constant. But here, constant means a constant vector. OK. Um, what about definite integrals? You, can, you do definite integrals component-wise. So if you integrate the velocity from a to b, you do this, and it means you anti, you, sorry, doesn't mean you anti-differentiate, it means you take the definite integral of each component. So 
you would have the integral from a to b of x prime of t dt, the integral from a to b of y prime of t dt, and the integral from a to b of z prime of t dt. <coughs> but we know how you evaluate those. This is x of t, this definite integral. You get x of t evaluated at b minus the value at a. Right? We're using the fundamental theorem, so this is x at b minus x at a. Similarly, this is y of b minus y of a. And this is z of b minus z of a. But you can split this up as a difference. It's x, y, and z evaluated at b, that vector, so well, that's the position vector evaluated at b, minus the x, y, and z evaluated at a, so minus the position vector at a. So what do you get? Just as with motion in, in the line, you get that the integral of velocity is the change in the position, where it's now the, ch the change, the difference of a position vector. Once again, this is called the displacement. And so what we find is what we found before. How do you find the displacement of an object moving in space? If you're given the velocity function, you integrate it. Of course, to know that this integral exists, we need to know that the velocity, well, exists. So we're assuming the position vector is differentiable. So each component function, x, y, and z, are differentiable. And then we need for this to be continuous. So we're assuming the position function is continuously differentiable. You can weaken that a little bit, but uh, I'd rather not go into the technical details of exactly the weakest assumptions that we could use. So what's, what's an example of calculating the displacement given the velocity? Well, it's actually, um, you know, it's not too hard to calculate displacement. Distance traveled is the hard one, just like it was in the line. But there is a particular example I wanted to do. Um, so an example. Um, suppose the velocity v of t is e to the t square root of t minus e to the minus t Suppose the velocity is that in where everything's in meters per second at time. Suppose we at time in meters per second at time t seconds. Okay, and our question is, what's what's the displacement? After we found the displacement, I'm going to ask, we're going to also determine the magnitude of the displacement. The, the displacement is a vector. That vector has a, a magnitude, or you, you picture length. And so we would be finding the distance, the straight line distance between the initial point and the final point of the, of the particle or the object, the magnitude of the displacement. <coughs> okay, so what do you do? Well, the, the displacement is easy. The, you integrate the velocity. Uh, except, I didn't say the displacement between what times. Um, What's the displacement of the object between times t equals 0 and t equals 1 second? All right, let's try that. The displacement, the integral from 0 to 1 of the velocity with respect to time. So 
it's the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the t, the square root of t, minus e to the minus t, dt. Um, we use the fundamental theorem three times, so we find an antiderivative of each of the component functions, and we evaluate at 1 and subtract what we get when we evaluate at 0. And the units that we'll get, this is in meters per second. This is in seconds, so we end up with meters, as we should. Um, all right. So what do we get? We get the integral from 0 to we actually, I'm going to anti-differentiate these just uh, quickly. An antiderivative of e to the t, e to the t. An antiderivative of the square root of 2 is the square root of 2 times t. And an antiderivative of e to the minus t, you can do that with a substitution of u equals um, minus t, but it's easy to see once I've given you the answer that it's right because it's an antiderivative. So. What's the derivative of e to the minus t? You get e to the minus t back, but by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of minus t, and that pick gives you a minus 1. So yeah, the derivative of this is minus e to the minus t, so this is an antiderivative of minus e to the minus t. And you evaluate from 0 to 1. So we get the value at 1, e, the square root of 2, e to the minus 1, minus what you get at 0, which is 1, 0, 1, and so we get e minus 1, the square root of 2, e to the minus 1, minus 1. This is in meters. Okay, so that's the displacement. Um, so what's the actual distance between the starting point and the, and the final point, the ending point? Well, that's the magnitude of the displacement. So the magnitude of the displacement equals, we have to take the magnitude of this vector That is the square root. I am not, we will not get a nice number. I'm just going to write it and we're essentially going to leave it. Plus the square root of 2 squared, but I know that's 2, but it's just so it's clear where it came from. So you get this, and units of this are meters. That's the magnitude of the displacement. All right, great. Displacement is easy. Magnitude of the displacement, even though it's a kind of ugly number, you could get out a calculator and do that. It's not going to simplify. You could try to simplify without a calculator. It's not going to simplify very far. Um, but that's the straight line distance between the initial position, so the position at time A, and the position at time B. But understand the, the particle or the object could have moved along. I'm not claiming that this curve, that uh, the position vector that we come up with looks like this, even up to adding an arbitrary constant. But the, the object is moving along some path in space. Here it starts somewhere, it ends somewhere. Um, and what we just found p of b minus p of a is this vector, and we found its magnitude. So we found the length of this vector. It really is length here. And so, yeah, that's the straight line distance between where the particle started and where it ended up. But you can ask the question, yes, but how far did the particle travel, meaning along this curve path? That's a much harder question. That's the distance traveled by the particle, and just like in motion in a line, it's the tough question. So uh, I want to come back to this function and find the distance traveled. And I picked a very special function. Um, 
so that we can actually do the integral that we get. It's not so easy. But, so let me leave this up here. But what we need to do is figure out, in terms of integration, how you would find the total distance traveled by some particle, some object. And of course what we do is chop things up into little pieces and we estimate and then we take limits. Uh, we chop things up into little pieces, we estimate on each piece, we add those together and we take limits. So we end up with an integral. And what we do is we estimate that on a small interval, like maybe here you are at p at time t naught and here you are at p at time t1, we estimate that the distance traveled along the curve is approximately equal to the straight line distance between the points. Of course, you know, in the long run, that might not be a good approximation, but if the two times are close together, so these points are close together, you would expect that this straight line distance between the two points should approximate, should be very close to the actual curve distance, and in the limit, give you the same infinitesimal thing. So, um, what's the, if so, suppose t naught, so we have some time, t naught, it's less than t1, let delta t equal t1 minus t naught, so this is positive. And what we're interested in is if delta t is small, or so close to zero, so t1 is close to t naught, then, then what? Then, um, delta s, this is what people like to use for the distance traveled, so the distance traveled between t equals t naught, or let me just say between t naught and t1. Um, the distance traveled between t naught and t1 should appro is approximately equal to well, the, the magnitude of that, the vector, so the distance between those points, but that's the magnitude of the vector, p at t1 minus p at t0. Um, right, it should be approximately that. Just um, that length. should be approximately, and we expect this approximation to get better as we take delta t smaller closer to zero. So, okay, we can rewrite this though. This means that delta s, this, we're thinking change in the total distance traveled, so that's the distance traveled between the two times, and s is just, it's a standard, it's standard for that to represent distance traveled or arc length of a curve. Um, distance traveled is, we can write this as, yeah, it's oops, approximately equal to p of t1, the magnitude of p of t1 minus p of t0, but that's the same as, it might not, hopefully it'll become clear why we want to write it this way, or it will become clear. This is the same as the magnitude of p of t1 minus p of t naught over delta t, because delta t is positive, its absolute value is the same as just delta t, times delta t. And now I'm going to write t1 is just t naught plus delta t. So this is t naught plus delta t. over delta t, and hopefully this looks familiar. This should look to you like the, what you take the limit of to get the derivative. And so 
This is what we do, and we think infinitesimally. We now take the limit as delta t approaches zero. So over here we write the infinitesimal ds, an infinitesimal change in distance um, along the curve, um, should be, as delta t approaches zero, this limit inside the absolute values is just the, the derivative of p at t naught. So we're getting the derivative of p at t naught times an infinitesimal change in t. <coughs> and we want to add up all of these little distances continuously as t goes from a to b. So what we find is the distance traveled is, we add up all of these, we want to, as t goes from a to b, we want to add up all of these little ds's, and now I should just say that's in an arbitrary time t, and it means you take the integral from a to b of the absolute value p prime of t, but p prime is the velocity. So you take the magnitude, I, I said the absolute value, I didn't mean that, <laughs> the, the magnitude of the velocity vector, and you integrate it with respect to time. This looks exactly like it did in the, when we just had motion in a line, except now we've got this old vector symbol over the V. But yeah, this is what you do. Um, in this context, this is frequently, this ds is frequently referred to as an element of arc length. It, we could just say length, the, the term arc is in there to make it clear that we mean length as you move along the, the curve, so the arcs, instead of like some straight line distance between where you start and where you end up. So it, really, if you left out arc, it would be the same thing. It's an infinitesimal change in the length of the curve, where the distance traveled, but yeah, we'll usually say arc length. Okay, this is the, the distance traveled. Um, the absolute value, or, I said it again. The magnitude of the velocity um, is what most people would refer to as the speed. So this, the magnitude of the velocity vector. This is speed. Now, that's how most people define speed in this context. However, in the, in the real line, we, in one dimension, we talked about this, that Oh, well, maybe it's better to define speed in such a way that there's an average, you could talk about an average speed, and then the, over a time interval, and then the, the, the instantaneous speed should be the limit of the average speeds as the time interval approaches zero. Um, but that means you need a notion of, kind of average speed, and average speed is the average rate of change of the distance traveled with respect to time. So you could define speed. So speed should equal the rate of change with respect to time of the distance traveled. But we've said that most people in this context define it as the magnitude of the velocity vector. Is, is there a problem here? No, there's not a problem. If you define the distance traveled function, you would define it as the distance traveled up until time t, where well, you start at a. Instead of going to b, we just go to some arbitrary time t, and you integrate the magnitude of the velocity. Um, I now need a dummy variable, since I have t as one of my limits of integration. So, this function gives you the distance, the total distance traveled, s of t, up until time t. So this equals the distance traveled between times a and t, where t could be most anything. Distance traveled between times a and t. 
right? It's the distance traveled function as a function of time. Oh, ah, there's a bad mistake here. Uh, this should be a u. Dummy variable u, dummy variable u. Normally we have t's there, but t is the limit of integration. <coughs> so, uh, but what do you get when you take the derivative with respect to t of this function? The fundamental theorem of calculus comes in. This, this function is an antiderivative of the function that you get when you just stick the t into the integrand. In other words, the derivative of that integral is the magnitude of the velocity. So it doesn't matter whether you define the speed to be the instantaneous rate of change of the distance traveled, or whether you define it to be the magnitude of the velocity vector, you get the same thing either way. Um, let's go back to the example we had where v of t, and I did erase it after I said I didn't want to, where v of t is e to the t the square root of t minus e to the minus t meters per second. All right, we, we already found the displacement, so the net change in the position, and we can find the magnitude of the displacement. But what should be true, since we believe the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and and this particle is not moving along a straight line, um, that the total distance traveled should come out greater than the magnitude of the displacement that we found before. I'm not going to verify that we actually get something greater, but I leave it as an exercise for you. So what do you do? And now we'll see that I did pick this velocity function to be very special. We need to calculate the integral of the magnitude of the velocity. Typically, these integrals are very difficult or nearly impossible, or possi possibly impossible, to get nice antiderivative formulas for. There are no elementary antiderivatives, and if there are, Nice, and uh, nice formulas, then they're frequently hard to find. Um, you pick very special examples if you want to get um, answers fairly quickly. Um, if you really wanted to know the distance traveled, you might need to use like Simpson's rule to approximate the integral that you get well. But I have picked a nice example here. So we want the distance traveled between time zero and one, and we know now that you integrate the magnitude of the velocity. So you integrate from 0 to 1 the square root of, we have e to the t squared plus the square root of 2 squared plus e to the minus t squared. And we have to integrate that with respect to t. Um, so what do you get? you get the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of, well, actually I'm just going to leave it as e to the t squared, but I'm going to put in this plus 2, and then I'm going to put in the, leave some space, and put in e to the minus t squared dt. Right? This is what this is. I didn't change this part. I didn't change this part. I squared the square root of 2 and got 2. But now I'm going to write 2 as 2 times e to the t times e to the minus t. I just multiplied by 1. Right? e to the t times e to the minus t is just 1. So this is, I didn't change anything. This is mathematician's stupid trick number 2. Multiply by 1 in a clever way. What's so clever about that? Well, hopefully you now see that this thing under the square root is a perfect square. This is the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of e to the t plus e to the minus t quantity squared, right? Because when you square, you get the first thing squared plus 2 times this times this plus this squared. Great. Then we take this, the square root of this thing squared. That's actually the absolute value of this quantity, but e to the t plus e to the minus t e to the t is always 
E to anything is always positive. That's a positive quantity. We don't need absolute values. We get the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the t plus e to the minus t. That's certainly easy to anti-differentiate. Anti-derivative of e to the t, e to the t, and anti-derivative of e to the minus t, minus e to the minus t. We evaluate from 0 to 1. We plug in 1. And you subtract what you get when you plug in 0. When we plug in 0, we get 1 minus 1. So that's 0. So our answer is just e minus e to the minus 1 meters. I, I should make a number of comments about this. First of all, you could compare this to what we got for the magnitude of the displacement by getting out a calculator and having it give you approximations to you know, 10 decimal places. And you'd see that this is bigger than what we found before. But you can actually compare them algebraically even without being able to get the decimals in. You'll see that this is bigger. Um, the other comment I should make is, in this example, this was a very special example, and the, um, it seems to be a lot easier in, to calculate the, the total distance traveled than it was to calculate the magnitude of the displacement. The displacement was easy to calculate, but its magnitude was kind of ugly. Um, and this worked out to be much nicer looking in the end and fairly short. I'll say it again. This is a very special example for just kind of arbitrary position functions. This integral is almost always undoable well, I mean, in, with any nice formulas. All right. Um, I'd like to look at a, a couple of simple examples in the plane um, and then talk about lengths of curves. But right now I still want to talk about motion, but in the plane. So <coughs> let's consider An object is moving in the plane. So the xy plane, or mathematically we say r2, two-dimensional real Euclidean space, is in the plane r2 with position function. So with position um, p of t equals t, the square root of 1 minus t squared. Uh, we could pick some units. How about feet? Feet um, at time t seconds. For t, t between minus 1 and 1. All right. I want to describe the path that the object moves along. that it moves along. So the set of points that you get from all the positions, that's actually the range of the position function. So you know, the set of things you get out of the function, i.e. the range of p of t. Uh, describe the path that the object moves along and find the distance traveled by the object between times minus 1 and 1. OK. So what 
What do you do? Well, there are lots of ways you could look at this, but... We're saying that the x-coordinate... We've got a position function that looks like, that looks like this. This means that the x-coordinate of the particle is always t, and the y-coordinate is the square root of 1 minus t squared. Now, if you eliminate the t, this might look more recognizable to you. So the x-coordinate of the particle and the y-coordinate of the particle are always related like this, which means that if you put in x for t here, it's always true that the y-coordinate of the particle is the square root of 1 minus um, the square of the x-coordinate of the particle. But if you square both sides of this, you get y squared equals 1 minus x squared, or what's the same thing, x squared plus y squared equals 1. You should recognize this as the standard equation for the circle of radius 1 centered at the origin, so the unit circle centered at the origin. And what we just did says that the particle is always on the unit circle. It doesn't say it gives us the entire unit circle. It just says the x and y coordinates always satisfy this equation. So the particle is always on that circle. How much of the circle do we get? Well, that y coordinate, it's v square root, is always greater than or equal to 0. And t, which is the same as x, is always between minus 1 and 1. So what are you getting? You're getting the top half of the circle of radius 1, so at the origin. So you're getting the semicircle. And at t equals minus 1, you're over here at the point 1, 0, uh, minus 1, 0. Let's try it again. t equals minus 1. You're at minus 1, 0. Um, at t equals 0, you're at 0, 1. And at t equals 1, you're at 1, 0. So the particle is traveling this way. Okay. Um, fine. So there's the path. What's the distance traveled by the particle? Well, this particle never, you know, as time goes forward from minus 1 to 1, the particle never backs up. As time goes on, the x-coordinate's going on. So the particle's always moving the same direction. So it never backtracks. It's, and so really, the position function is one-to-one. -one. You don't hit any point more than once. Um, so since we don't hit any point more than once, the total distance traveled should just be the same as the length of this semicircle, so the arc length of the semicircle. If, if we backtrack, then the distance traveled, well, if you kind of bounce back and forth along here, and finally made it over to here, your distance traveled would be greater than this length. But we never do back up. We never go back over points we've been over. So the distance traveled should be, without doing an integral, the distance traveled should be, if things are working the way they should be, should equal well, the circumference of a semicircle of radius 1. Um, so it should be half, because it's 2 pi r, but our radius is 1, so it should be half of 2 pi. So we should get pi feet. OK, that's what we get from simple high school geometry, knowing the length, the uh, circumference of a circle. <laughs> Let's make sure that we get the same thing by integrating. As you'll see, the integral is much harder than using things you learned in high school geometry, but part of that's because we picked our, our particle is moving with a very strange speed. Okay. Let's make sure that we get the same thing. By integrating. It's, in a way, it's not clear that you should because our function, our position function is not continuously differentiable. However, um, it's good enough. It's continuous. It's differentiable on the open interval between minus 1 and 1. And, and the integral exists. And that's enough.
So here's our position function. P prime of t, the velocity, it won't exist at time minus 1 and 1, and it's still OK. So v of t, the velocity, is the derivative of the position. It is 1, and then 1 half times 1 minus t squared to the minus 1 half. And then by the chain rule, we have to multiply times the derivative of the stuff inside. So you pick up times a minus 2t. Uh, the 2's cancel, and you get the velocity vector is 1 over min uh, times 1 comma minus t over the square root of 1 minus t squared. So this, um, this is in feet per second. Notice that, yeah, we have a problem when t is 1 and minus 1. So this function is not differentiable. It, it's OK. It's, um, because the integral of the speed is still going to exist. OK. Um, the magnitude of the velocity is the square root of 1 squared plus minus t over the square root of 1 minus t squared squared. That is the square root of 1 plus t squared over 1 minus t squared. But then you get a common denominator. You write 1 as 1 minus t squared over 1 minus t squared. Then you add, and you get 1 minus t squared plus t squared. So you just end up with a 1 in the numerator. And so what you end up with is that the speed, the magnitude of the velocity, at times unequal to minus 1 and 1, you get that the speed is 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared feet per second. All right. So what's happening? It's you're moving the object, a particle, whatever, is moving around this semicircle of radius 1 centered at the origin. <coughs> What you can, the speed as t approaches plus or minus 1 gets close and gets larger and larger, so approaches infinity. Um, but your velocity vectors are tangent to this curve, so what's happening at, is, um, at, for instance, when t is 1, the velocity is 1, but when you get closer to these ends, uh, sorry, when t is 1, the speed is 1. Um, the velocity at time, at time 0 should be 1, 0 so at the vector. If you draw it starting at the origin, it goes out to 1, 0, but we draw velocity vectors at the point, uh, at the position, the point where the object is. So, um, but the speed is bigger all the other times. So as you get closer and closer here, the speed, you're always tangent to the circle. The velocity is always tangent to the circle. But the magnitude of the velocity is much bigger. And as you get close to here, it becomes arbitrarily big. I'll just run into everything. And here, you, know, you should picture it goes off to infinity. And here it goes down to infinity. And as you get close to there, it's arbitrarily big. Um, so this is, um, yeah, this is uh, bad, and it's hard to imagine a, an object or a particle really doing this. But if it did, then we could find the total distance traveled by taking the integral from minus 1 to 1. We're, we know what the answer better come out to be. It better come out to be pi. Does it? The distance traveled should be the integral from minus 1 to 1 
of 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared dt. This is an improper integral that we, we looked at much earlier. And it's got two problem points. It has a problem when t is minus 1 and a problem when t is 1. And so you split this up. You have to split this up as the integral from minus 1 to somewhere. Uh, 0 is a convenient place in between, minus 1 and 1, but it doesn't really matter. Plus the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared dt. Right. And now this improper integral means you take the limit as at, you replace minus 1 by like an a, and you take the limit as a approaches minus 1 from the right, and you replace the 1 here by some variable like b, and you take the limit as b approaches 1 from the left, and you evaluate these two integrals. At least the antiderivative is easy. We know an, the ant, or an antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared. It's the inverse sine of t. But we still have to calculate. So we have the integral from minus 1 to 0 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared plus the integral from 0 to 1 dt plus the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared dt. We replace this by an what that integral means is you replace this by an a and take the limit as a approaches minus 1 from the right. And you replace this by some variable like a b and you take the limit as b approaches 1 from the left. An antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared, inverse sine of t. <coughs> so you get the limit as a approaches minus 1 from the right of the inverse sine of 0 minus the inverse sine of a. And you add to that the limit as b approaches 1 from the left of the inverse sine evaluated at b minus the inverse sine of 0. <laughs> We're getting there. I told you the high school geometry approach of just knowing that that circumference is pi was easier. The inverse sine of 0 is 0. As a approaches minus 1 from the right, inverse sine approaches um, minus pi over 2. And so we get minus minus pi over 2. Um, it, you should think, you should think, oh, the sine of negative pi over 2 um, you should think, yeah, the sine of negative pi over 2 is negative 1. Um, okay, and then you add to that what you get as b approaches 1 from the left. Um, you get inverse sine of 0 is still 0. Inverse sine is continuous, and the inverse sine of 1 is pi over 2. And so we get Minus minus pi over 2 plus pi over 2, we get pi over 2 plus pi over 2, pi, feet, yippee. <laughs> it's the same thing we got before. Um, why is this calculation so difficult? Well, it's, it, there, there are a couple of possible answers. One is, well, you're told that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, but how, did, how was that proved? Was it easier or harder than this? But the other answer, or the other possible answer, is that maybe this was just kind of a bad way to move around a circle. Yeah, we said we had an object moving around the semicircle according to that parameterization. But if all we want is the length of the path that it travels, we could take any other position function. We could imagine a particle, have a particle, moving along that semicircle with a different position function. And as long as, it never, as long as it covers the whole semicircle and never backs up, we could use that position function to calculate the length instead of the one we did use. So why don't we try that? So what is another parameterization 
Uh, another, ha, I said a word I was trying to hold off on using. Yes, we call this kind of making up a position function that, that an object could move along. We call that a parameterization of the curve. So what we're doing is picking a new parameterization of the curve. So how about a new P of T? I'm going to pick P of T equals minus the cosine of T sine of T for T between 0 and pi. All right. I claim that that would describe the position that also would describe the position of something that starts here at, at minus 1, 0 and moves clockwise around the semicircle of radius 1 centered at the origin and at time pi is over here. Right? Um, certainly you can verify, so if we write this out, this is called, these are called parametric equations. <coughs> We're saying the x coordinate's always minus cosine of t, y coordinate sine of t. So if you square them and add, you get minus cosine squared, minus cosine quantity squared, that's cosine squared, plus sine squared. Fundamental trig identity, that's 1. So yes, the x and y coordinates always lie on the circle of radius 1 centered at the origin. Um, sine between, for t between 0 and pi is always greater than or equal to 0, so we're always on the top half of the circle. When t is 0, we are at minus cosine of 0, that's minus 1, 0, so we're here. When t is pi, you get minus the cosine of pi, that's minus minus 1, comma 0, so yeah, we're over here. <coughs> so yeah, once again, this describes the position of something that's moving along a semicircle of radius 1 centered at the origin that at, starts over here at minus 1, 0, and ends over here at 1, 0. We call this a, a parameterization of this curve. Um, I'm going to add some words, a simple regular parameterization later, but in a few minutes, but um, it describes something moving along the same curve, and, and we ought, it, it, it never backs up. Um, um, minus cosine of t is always increasing for t between 0 and pi. You could check that. I mean, it's, you should know, but the derivative of minus cosine would be minus, minus sine, so plus sine. For t between 0 and pi, that's greater than or equal to 0, so the x-coordinate is always increasing. So, yeah, the particle never backs up. It just keeps going that way, so you're not retracing your path, and we ought to be able to find the distance traveled by integrating from 0 to pi the magnitude of this velocity vector. Right. The magnitude of the velocity vector for this position function. But this one's easy. In fact, I'm just going to cram it in right here. This one's easy. V of t, the derivative of p of t, derivative of cosine is minus sine. So we get minus minus sine. So sine, derivative of sine is cosine. And the magnitude of the velocity vector is the square root of sine squared t plus cosine squared t. But that's 1. So this particle, if we think of this, you know, if this is really described particle moving, unlike before where the speed became infinite as you got near the end, so the speed of this is always just 1. So it always has the same speed. Always just one. <laughs> that certainly makes <laughs> this distance traveled integral very simple. The magnitude of the velocity, so the speed is always one. Integral of one with respect to t, uh, wait, I'll do it in my head, t, 
and you evaluate it from 0 to pi. So you plug in pi and you subtract what you get at 0. So you get pi feet. Feet. We were using feet. As you can see, <laughs> this is much simpler. Um, and it's because we picked, we imagined a particle moving along here in a nice way, or what's the same thing? We picked a parameterization of the curve in a, in a nice way, and that made the calculation easy. It gave us what we got with the bad, or bad, bad position function, but uh, we didn't, you know, before we had an improper integral, had to split it up, had to take some limits. This is so nice, so easy. Um, so, right. So I have kind of explained how you would find the length of a curve. If you've got a curve in the plane or in space, so here's some curve. By the way, for a mathematician, a curve is something one-dimensional. So we uh, tend to call even straight lines curves. It's a little annoying, but we do that. So you've got this curve in the plane or in space, and you'd like to know its length. Um, for that matter, I I've drawn a nice curve, but you know, we have a kind of an intuitive notion of what a nice looking curve looks like. But I want to define that too. But right now, just appealing to your intuition, suppose you have a curve. How would you find its length? Well, you, you find a parameterization. So you find a position function of an object. which moves along the curve. So, so we want a P of T that as T goes for T on, in some closed interval, and we want one of these endpoints to be P at A we want the other endpoint to be P at B. And then we want, as T goes from A to B, we want P of T to trace out all the points on the curve and to do it only once so that the distance traveled is the same as the length of the curve. But we don't have to think of that. The reason position function is in quotes is you don't actually have to think of anything moving. It's kind of a nice intuitive way of thinking about it, that, oh, something's moving, and as long as it doesn't back up or retrace its path, the distance traveled is the same as the length of the curve. It's true, but you don't actually have to think of anything moving. <coughs> we just need P of T to give us every point on the curve, whether it's the position of something that's moving or not, for it to do it only once and for it to be continuously differentiable. Um, so we do that, so, and It also lets us kind of define in what seems like an almost backwards way what we mean by kind of a nice curve like the one I've got drawn there. So a simple, so this is a definition, a simple regular parameterization. function of a curve in, I'm going to say in Rn, and I mean n is 2 or 3, so either we're in R2, the, the plane, or R3 space. Well, it could be 1, R1, just in the, in the real line. 
For that matter, if you were comfortable in higher dimensions, it could be anything. You can, n is 5, but let's just stick with n is 1, 2, or 3. <coughs> a simple regular parameterization is a function. So p, our I think position function, from a closed interval in the real line, um, and here I want a is less than b, so that there's actually an open interval in there that's not empty, into Rn. So it's a function with some properties. So what properties? We want, um, which is differentiable. And now I have to say, on an open interval, containing a, b. It's possible to weaken this, as we, as we looked at in that one parameterization, with, or that one position function that was t, comma, the square root of 1 minus t squared. We don't really need differentiability at the endpoints of the interval. We could get by with just continuity. It makes the statement a lot uglier, and I'm just going to state it like this. So what I'm saying is that we have a function that's actually defined on a, in an open interval containing this closed interval. It's differentiable on that bigger open interval. And this function is that function defined on a bigger set, restricted to this smaller set. <coughs> anyway, it's a differentiable. Um, actually, I want continuously differentiable. continuously differentiable, so that the derivative, the thing, velocity of something we're moving is a continuous function. Um, right, is continuously differentiable, um, which is continuously differentiable, and is one to one. Oh, and it's one to one. Is one to one, so that means the there's no backtracking that you don't hit, go over the same points more than once. In fact, we could allow it to go back over the same, a finite number of points more than once because that wouldn't add any length because of finite points. But again, we're just trying to do a simple thing. And there's a technical condition that makes lots of things easier. And, um, and so we're going to say, and P prime is never zero. So it's a continuously differentiable function that's one to one and such that, which is differentiable as one half, such that p prime, so is never the zero vector. We don't want the particle to stop. Um, that makes lots of technical things nice um, that we're not going to go into, but um, it also, Intuitively, it makes sense. I mean, even if you could describe a particle moving along the path and you described it as one that stops at some places, well, that's not helping you measure the length any. If it stops, you might as well not have it stop, keep moving the whole time, and then talk about how far it traveled. So you might as well kind of omit the places, the times when it stopped. All right, so this is a simple regular parameterization of a curve. What, what, what's a curve? Well, this sounds backwards, but a curve, a curve is the range so, of any simple regular parameterization of a curve. This kind of sounds backwards. We like to think of the set of points as existing first, and that you pick a parameterization for it. This kind of says you need a parameterization first, and then you define the curve to be all the points that the parameterization gives you. Yes, um, that is what we're doing. And it's because it's difficult to, to describe in most any other way exactly what kinds of nice, what it means for a curve to be nice. 
But we're saying the curve is the set of points. And you can have different regular parameterizations that give you the same points, just like we did with uh, the semicircle, except one of those wasn't a simple regular parameterization because it wasn't differentiable at the endpoints. But you can pick different parameterizations for the same curve. So it's the set of points that's the curve, and the parameterization is something else. I should warn you that in many books, especially in advanced math text, a curve is defined to be the parameterization. The parameterization so a curve is a function. I think that's um, confusing terminology. I won't use it. But just be aware, if you read other books, <coughs> they might refer to kind of a curve as the function that we're, um, that we're calling the parameterization. Um, OK. So great. So suppose we've got um, a curve. And by the way, I'll also call this a simple regular curve to be more precise. A simple regular curve, it's a set of points you get out of a simple regular parameterization. And the point is that it doesn't matter what simple regular parameterization you pick of a simple regular curve. The length, so the arc length, of that curve C, you would just integrate from A to B. And now I'm just writing the magnitude of P prime of T because, as I've said, you don't really have to think of anything moving. So I don't want to call this the velocity anymore, and I really shouldn't call T the time or P the position. You take a simple regular parameterization of your simple regular curve. Um, you take its derivative. You take its, its magnitude, and you integrate. Um, and it doesn't matter what parameterization you pick. I want to do a couple more examples where I calculate arc length this way. We've, we've actually already done it twice um, with the semicircle, and there one of them, I say it for like a third time, wasn't a simple regular parameterization, but it was good enough. And I'd rather not write all the technical details of the more general case. But um, this is nicest in the plane, and where curves, well, you have other ways that curves are usually described to you. They're usually described to you as graphs of functions. And it's kind of nice to see what this reduces to, and I'd like to do a couple of examples there, and we'll stop. So suppose now we're in the xy plane. So in R2, so two dimensions. Then there are three ways that you typically have curves described, to you, curves described to you. One is in this by giving a simple regular parameterization. That means you specify and you're given x as a function of time. All right. If I call t time, just realize I don't really mean it has to be time, but I'm frequently thinking of it that way. Now you're given x as a function of t. And y is a function of t. And then, of course, the, the position function that we're talking about, once again, I've lapsed into motion terminology, position function. The parameterization is x of t, y of t. The derivative of that is x prime of t. Maybe I'll write dx dt dy dt, switch to Leibniz's notation. And so the arc length equals the integral from a to b of the magnitude of this vector. That's the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. Um, right. Uh, OK, so you can do that. You need that for this to be one to one. And for it to be really a simple regular parameterization, we would need that this p prime of t is never 0. Um, but this is what you do to calculate the arc length. We've already done a couple of examples that way. So let me say what happens when you're given curves 
ways that you're more used to being given them, you're probably not used to being given curves parametrically. It's, you're more used to being told maybe you've got y as a function of x um, and where f is continuously differentiable. Then what happens? How would we parametrize this curve for x between a and b? <coughs> well, there's an obvious parametrization. You can let x be t, and y then, if x is t, y is f of t. And since x was between a and b and x is t, t is between a and b. Oh, but so what does that mean? It means that, yeah, when we take what we had for our parametric version of arc length, well, now x is t. So I'm going to eliminate the t's. So if x is t, this is dx dx, well that's just 1. And if x is t, this is dy dx, and this is dx. So what we get in this case is that this formula reduces to 1, yeah, there should be a squared here, 1 plus dy dx squared times dx. Um, I should say that this parameterization is automatically one to one because x is just t. If you take two different t values, you'll automatically get at least a different x coordinate, even if you get the same y coordinate. Well, that's enough. Function is one to one. So uh, this will, assuming f is continuously differentiable, uh, the speed is also never, never zero because it's one plus something squared. So very good. Um, would have a simple regular parameterization, and you'd calculate the distance traveled with this formula. That's if you're given y as a function of x. What happens if you're given, sometimes, bizarrely, you're given x as a function of y? Suppose you're given x as a function of y. Well, then, Again, there's an obvious parameterization. Now you pick y to be t, and x then would be f of t. And what happens to our general parameterized version of arc length? You get the integral from a to b. Well, now y is t, so we're going to replace all the t's with y's. So this is now the square root of dx dy squared plus dy dy, that's 1 squared, that's 1, times dy. And so you calculate that. All right, so this is what you do for curves in the plane, especially if they're given to you as y is a function of x or x is a function of y. Um, you integrate these things, I, I'll say it again, these, these can be very difficult. And I, I've picked some very special examples just so that things work out nicely, but understand that you have to be very careful in picking examples or the integrals will either turn out to be extraordinarily difficult or impossible. Impossible to find elementary antiderivatives. So let's do a completely So find the arc length of y equals two thirds x to the three halves. I'm laughing because of how special this is. For zero less than or equal to x less than or equal to four. Uh, no, how about eight?
Okay, let's do that. Okay, so what do you do? Well, we're given y as a function of x. So the arc length. The arc length is just the integral from 0 to 8 of the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dx. This is the integral from 0 to 8 of the square root of 1 plus dy dx. <laughs> you take the derivative of this. 3 halves comes down. It wipes that out. So you just get a 1. And you subtract 1 from the exponent. So you get x to the 1 half. squared dx. This is the integral from 0 to 8 of the square root of 1 plus x dx. We'll make the substitution u equals 1 plus x and we'll get an answer. So our arc length is so we have the integral from 0 to 8 of the square root of 1 plus x. Let me write that as 1 plus x to the 1 half dx. You make the substitution, u equals 1 plus x, so that du is dx. I'm going to switch the limits of integration to describe what u does. So this is this is u to the 1 half, right? 1 plus x is u, dx is du. The limits of integration switch, when x is 0, u is 1. When x is 8, u is 9. You integrate this using the power rule. You get you add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent and evaluate from 1 to 9. This is 2 thirds. 9 to the 3 halves minus 1 to the 3 halves. This is 2 thirds. Now you see exactly how special this is. So the 1 half, that's the square root of 9, that's 3. 3 cubed, 27 minus 1. So we get 26 or 52 thirds. <coughs> 52 thirds. All right. Well, that was, <laughs> that was clearly a very special example. Um, the integral came out to be easy, even the numbers came out to be nice. Let's do one more, which is going to <laughs> also be kind of obviously n nice. Suppose you're given x is e to the e to the y plus e to the minus y over 2. Um, you may know what this is. This is the hyperbolic cosine, usually referred to as cosh, cosh of y. But I'll, I'll use it like this. So it doesn't, you don't have to know that this is, that function has a name. So let's find the arc length. Now we're given x as a function of y. So, oh, I didn't say for y between what and what. Uh, for 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to the natural log of 3. So let's find the arc length. You just integrate from 0 to the natural log of 3 dx dy squared plus 1 dy. Okay, so you get the integral from 0 to the natural log of 3. dx dy, we get we get e to the y e to the y minus e to the minus y. Right? I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to y. We get e to the y minus e to the minus y from the chain rule over 2 squared plus 1. Yuck! This looks like it might be extremely difficult to integrate. However, it's not. 
So that's kind of a, the same trick we saw earlier, in a sense. So we get the integral from 0 to the natural log of 3. We get the square root of, well, let me rewrite it, e to the y minus e to the minus y over 2 squared plus 1 dy. You might think you make some substitution. No, you do some algebra. You go ahead and you square that. So you expand it. This is the integral from 0 to the natural log of 3 times the square root of, you get this term squared, and I'm just going to leave it that way, it's e to the y squared. Yeah, that's e to the 2y, but leave it like this. You get the cross terms, minus 2 times that times that, but e to the y times e to the minus y is 1, so we just get a minus 2, and then a plus e to the minus y squared, all over 4, plus 1, but I'm going to write 1 as 4 over 4. And then we integrate with respect to y. The nice thing is, <coughs> you add this 4 in the numerator, that minus 2 becomes a plus 2. And then you should recognize that as the same perfect square, except with a plus sign there. So we get the integral from 0 to the natural log of 3 times the square root of e to the y squared plus 2 plus e to the minus y squared over 4 dy, but that numerator or inside the square root is exactly e to the y plus e to the minus y, and the denominator is squared. Now you square e to the y plus e to the minus y, you get e to the y squared plus 2 times this times this, so that's just plus 2 plus that squared, and then there's the 4. So, once again, uh, we get the square root of something squared. This thing is always positive, so normally we'd get the absolute values, but it's always positive. So we get the integral from 0 to the natural log of 3 of e to the y plus e to the minus y over 2 dy. But that's easy to integrate. You pull out the 1 half. An integral in the antiderivative of e to the y, e to the y, antiderivative of e to the minus y, minus e to the minus y. And you evaluate from 0 to the natural log of 3. We get 1 half e to the natural log of 3, that's 3, minus e to negative the natural log of 3, that's 3 to the minus 1, so that's minus a third, minus what you get at 0. At 0, you get 1 minus 1, that's 0. So this is our answer. We could I'll write as 27, 26 thirds, 13 thirds. Right, this is 27 thirds minus 1 third, 26 thirds divided by 2, 13 thirds. All right. This is how you deal with motion in space and displacement and distance traveled and arc lengths of curves. I'll say it again that the distance traveled, which is essentially the same calculation as the arc length of a curve, at least if your particle doesn't retrace some of its path already, is, um, is usually awful. And I've picked some very specific, some very special examples. Um, but in theory, this is how you always <laughs> find the, the length of any simple regular curve. In practice, it's not usually this easy. All right. Next time, we'll, uh, we'll look at volumes and, and how you find volumes of interesting shapes using integration. And those integrals usually come out nicer than these integrals.